Jonathan? Right. We're on. And yeah. we're live. Okay. <laughs> Hi, okay. Hi, and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, thank you. If you'd like to, those of you online, if you want to use the chat, please share where you are. You can even share fun stories about Peter, how you know him, how, why he's so great, <laughs> and all of these amazing things. Um, we have a small group here joining us at the mill, and I'm going to ask them to just be their lovely selves, and um, we're going to have a lot of fun this evening. And I'd like to mahalo Peter, of course, for um, all of the work that he's done here at the mill. It was a no-brainer to have his exhibition here um, to feature his work. He's been teaching for over 40 years and at the mill, particularly for about 10 years. So um, we're thankful for him and his time and his generosity. Uh, also for the artists that are included in the exhibit, um, his diehard students, and we have them joining us here today in the, stu in the studio. Uh, <laughs> and if you have any questions for them, uh, you know, if you've come and seen the show, please uh, feel free to write that as well. Um, the other artists are um, Haida Kuhn, Chris Lindborg, Deirdre Fortune, and Stanford Oyama. So if you are on Hawaii, please come and visit. Um, and mahalo also to the Hawaii County uh, Grant and Aid Program and the County Contingency Fund. So mahalo nui to all of our county council members who work so hard um, for our community. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to start and introduce Peter Durst, um, artist featured here in the exhibition series, Ceramic Work of Form and Image. Mahalo, Nui. Thank you, Mina. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for Zooming in. Thanks for all of you here. Um, I am going to unmask myself. We are all distance, and uh, hopefully this will go a little smoother that way. Um, I am going to uh, show you pictures and talk about uh, a bunch of the series that I have made uh, the last eight or nine years, uh, both here in Hawaii and in uh, Colorado where we live uh, the rest of the time. And uh, hopefully you will get uh, a feeling of uh, how one piece might lead to another. Um, I like to work in series is because I like to be able to work out uh, ideas and themes. So uh, one piece leads to another and often the series leads to the next. Um, over this period of time, I have uh, been working in what has come to be uh, two different styles for me. Uh, the first I would call faux wood. Um, and that was, those are the first three or four years. And the rest, um, I sort of refer to as faux metal, but they're not metal really. But they evolved into a, uh, a look, uh, modality, which I use on many of my forms now. And that involves uh, uh, making almost half of the pieces uh, with decals and bright color glaze and a ribbon line, which I use in my work to uh, separate and create some movement. And uh, then uh, cutouts to create uh, negative space and pattern and color. And uh, I'm not exactly sure why this format has settled in with me, but uh, I like it. And that's what uh, you'll be seeing in a lot of this work. Um, and the third element of this is that I have uh, been uh, involved in ceramic decal transfers for the last uh, eight years or so. And uh, like much of my work, uh, it started small. And as time progressed over the years, it became more and more part of my work. So uh, those are the uh, uh, what I plan to sh uh, share with you tonight. Um, I am going to speak. I got way too many pictures. I am going to speak for about half hour, and then at that point we will fast forward through the rest of the series and uh, with with minimal explanation. But hopefully by then you will not have the stories behind each piece, but you'll see how one thing leads to another. Um, I have been uh, working, doing what I'm doing in in, in art for almost 50 years. First as a uh, uh, potter and then as a mixed media sculptor and ceramic sculptures and uh, for better or worse I am uh, mostly self-taught but I had the good fortune uh, very early in my career before I knew I wanted to be a ceramist I was interested in ceramics and uh, 
uh, by good fortune, I landed at the Anderson Ranch in Snowmass, uh, which is very much into uh, uh, process as opposed to product of art. So I learned, I uh, got a very good basis in, in, in clay and in, in finding clays, making clays, uh, glazes, uh, formulating glazes, applying glazes, uh, building kilns, firing kilns. So all these things which I didn't know would serve me so well later in my life. So I was very fortunate to do that. Um, and um, after that, we moved down to uh, Colorado. We moved down to Denver. Or I moved down to Denver, uh, where I've been since then. And we are very fortunate to be able to have been coming coming here for the last uh, ten or eleven years, and have a studio here. So when we are in Denver, um, this let's start the pictures. Um, this is where I work. Uh, about thirty plus years ago, I was starting to work on a large scale. And I needed uh, higher higher ceilings and bigger space, so I found this old, uh, uh, fairly dilapidated uh, old automotive uh, garage and repair. Those uh, two front panels of windows uh, were these big old wooden pull chain doors, you know, and the curb cuts were there, so people would drive in, and it was uh, pretty much of a pit, but it had good bones. So this is where I've been for. Uh, 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 30 years and it has been a, a sanctuary for me. Um, and the front part has uh, turned and evolved into a gallery where uh, you see some of my work and uh, occasionally I do uh, shows with other people's work. Uh, so that, that's what this is. And uh, this is what really interested me in the building, which is my studio space. It is big and high ceilinged and had these uh, two big uh, skylights uh, it had been very dark and sooty um, and uneven on a floor, but I uh, basically put a new floor in to level things and uh, uh, power washed and, and painted things, sprayed things white. And these two skylights, which had, had, were like columns, uh, 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 are, uh, are wonderful, a lot of light in there. Um, also on the right side in the back, there are a bank of windows, uh, which form a courtyard which I will show you in just a second. But so these are, uh, right here is my slab roller, which is a piece that I have, a tool I've been using on virtually all my work here for the last, uh, all my work that I've been making these last uh, eight or 10 years. And then I have an extruder and I have some big kilns in the back and a couple wheels. So this is where I uh, work. And uh, I've been teaching uh, a couple days a week uh, for 20 plus years there. So it, we have a little family and a community and it's a uh, very talented uh, uh, people uh, work there, you know. When you teach, I guess you're the teacher and people take your class or students, but I really think of us all more like as studio mates because uh, they are very talented artists as are the people I work with here. And uh, we actually teach each other back and forth. So I'm very fortunate to be able to have a couple days with, with people and the rest of the time by myself. Uh, next. And this is uh, the courtyard, which uh, was full of uh, debris uh, from 40 years of oil and gunk, but we took down a fence and uh, put things up and made a little garden. And uh, that's uh, right adjacent to, to those windows that I look out on. And next. And here, uh, we live a very different life, uh, uh, rural and remote, and uh, our garage is, is my studio, and it is uh, wonderful in its own right, too. I have a smaller slab roller and uh, a big uh, oval kiln, which allows me to make my uh, big work, and a wheel. So um, that, uh, that is, is what, uh, um, where, I, where I do it all. Um, so. Um, I am going to get into the series now. I call these uh, my boats, and I'll do houses and water towers and a few others, but really they're forms. They're not boats, they're not houses, they're forms of those things. So I have license immediately to, to use that as an image, but not any need to make a boat. Um, and uh, my influences are, uh, you know, where ideas come from is a very interesting uh, uh, thing and hard to parse sometimes. Uh, so nature is a big, a big influence, influencer in my work. But I get uh, all other, you know, dreams, uh, seeing bits of other people's work, uh, just, just other things. All, they all go into making 
uh, combination which make up uh, the piece and elements I add to it. But I had the uh, good fortune to uh, travel uh, to uh, Southeast Asia and Central America and the Caribbean in the early 2000s uh, quite a few times. And aside from the ge geographic beauty, I was uh, struck with the, the beautiful, the brightness, the lushness of the colors. And uh, as well, um, the uh, wooden houses, which were falling apart, but staying together, often up on stilts, which I thought was a wonderful look. And all the boats in the harbor were in various states of, uh, of, of decay and cracks. And uh, uh, it uh, spoke to me and I had been doing things other than clay and I got back and started doing clay. And so I made uh, a series of boats and this was the first one. And uh, it's about 24 inches. And I was just experimenting with a uh, faux wood, which you see on the seats and uh, a crawl glaze, which has become also a part of my work these years. And uh, I've always liked uh, ripped and torn edges uh, on my work. It gives uh, a feeling of, uh, I like my work to be time-based. Uh, looks like it has seen better days and yet uh, still uh, holds together. And, uh, and of course, of significance is uh, ultimately to me that they be beautiful pieces. So that are, those are my, that's my uh, interest. And, and one thing leads to another. So next picture. Uh, this is a close-up of, of the detail of a boat, which from that others, I, it, they all, they're all now 40 inches, which is the size of my kiln. And uh, what I was impressed with in those travels was uh, color of decay and color being put on color, being put on color, painted over and over. So I started to do pieces this way with uh, layered of colors in the, in the planks. Uh, next picture. Uh, but ultimately, I thought that visually made a better representation was to alternate colors uh, of the planks. And that is what I have done for the rest of that uh, faux series. Um, also, I like, as I mentioned, I like to make pieces which are similar, but are always changing. And uh, a negative space and holes and things falling apart has always appealed to me. So I started to cut holes in this boat. And... Uh, and um, and do more faux work. Um, these are very time consuming. Uh, I didn't realize how long it would take to do this. Uh, um, and in some ways less is more that a few strokes might do the same thing, but uh, I'm not, my work doesn't work that way, unfortunately, or whatever. Uh, so it took a lot of time to make each one of these a little bit better, bigger. Uh, so they would look like uh, the grain had spread more or things would be in deterioration. Uh, next picture. And uh, my clay body lended itself to that. It's a very rough clay body with a lot of, uh, a lot of grog in it. So when I, I first would make the lines when it was soft enough that you could get a pretty smooth and even line where you want. And then as it got harder, I would go over it and widen it each time. And... Uh, as the clay got harder, all those little granules in the clay would start to come out and it would look more like uh, wood uh, fissuring. And I also, uh, the, the front of this boat or whatever, that left side of it, um, I started to uh, formalize my cutout patterns. And that has actually uh, stayed in my work today. Um, and I also, more and more color in my work, which is, which is something I enjoy and has been a signature of my work. Um, next piece. So those, my, that's a big jump. Uh, those were the faux wood boats. I made a bunch of them and they all kept changing. Um, they morphed into, uh, this was uh, from the faux metal series and jumping ahead in time, this is fairly far on in those series because this is all decaled on the inside. And uh, when I started with decals, I started on a very small scale. Uh, this is, there are several, there is a boat in the show and several of the boats I make now are similar to this pattern. And once again, I talked about cutouts, decal, a ribbon, and some texture on the side. Uh, next. So uh, this is an old boat as well. And this is what the first of these decals were. I uh, started very small with just little images found on a computer and put them on uh, one at a time and put them over this. I also just did a different rim. I liked the torn and cracked and how things work. Uh, 
so I am going to explain a little bit about this decal process of, of uh, next picture. Um, so um, it, is, it is based on uh, a printer that allows iron toner, which is uh, uh, iron oxide is used in ceramics uh, a lot as a colorant. So any, any image or word that you can get onto a printer, you can make a decal of, and they will all come out where the dark is, will be the sepia toned. And depending on the glaze you put behind it, you will get uh, the varying uh, color and images. So this is just, an, and I buy, buy decal paper from a company and it's, it's made to melt at uh, 1800 degrees, which is ultimately fired to and it will fuse into the fuse into the piece, and you're done. And it and the decal is part of the imagery. Um, so this is just a piece of white back paper. But if you imagine, uh, and this is uh, you put this in water for 30 seconds, and then you pull the paper off next, and you get a transparency. So I hung this up in my stu studio just to took a picture of it to show what the transparency looks like. But it's fortuitous because of all the colors in the background. Uh, that is what you get when you put it on a glaze. So if you put it, put this over a blue glaze, you get that. And if you put it over a yellow glaze or green, you get that. And those are the colors and that's how decaling works. So it's very simple in some ways um, and has its own complexities like other things. Um, next. And this is just that same thing on a piece of canvas. And you will see this image on some finished pieces later. Next. So um, while I was doing the boats, which were long, I also like to do vertical high. So this is about four and a half feet. And I started small in a small house all together without poles in it. Uh, uh, but I like the idea of birds and houses and humans. Uh, so I got to making them with a uh, door and windows and a circle for a bird hole. And, um, I got to doing these series. So I like to work in series and I started to put content in. Uh, this is, uh, th these are rules. There are 14 rules on this house and I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry I don't have a close up to show you. Um, it basically, they are 14 different, uh, hopefully humorous ways of saying that uh, the female and women are far superior to men and males in every way conceivable. And, uh, and you better get it. So um, this started and I thought it was really funny. And actually I'd, I'd done this on a, a different piece first um, and uh, it was successful and I liked it and I just repeated it. And so in the new series, I got to play with the uh, size and shape and color and uh, format. So I made a whole series of these by about 10 of them by changing the shape, by elongating them, they're all big and uh, they're all on bases and they all became rules and they had a lot of cracks and, and tears in them. And that is really what I like best uh, about is the, the way they look like they're falling apart. So these are all formatted the same, even though the shape is different. And I'll show you a few more and you get the idea. So on the other side of this is what the front of a house would look like. So this one would have a door and a lot of windows because it's tall and a bird house on top. And then on the sides would be the holes for the birds. So next. So I made a whole bunch of these and this is about three feet long and 12 inches and six inch base. And uh, uh, so it has rules on it as well. Um, so, and you can see the house is in state of falling apart uh, um, and then same, same pattern. So on the back are the, ru the rules of this house uh, is a poem from uh, Emma Lazarus, which is on the Statue of Liberty about give me, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to be breathe free. Um, and I use this on uh, some pieces later on as well. But so I've made uh, uh, a water tower and uh, an obelisk using the same idea of uh, an American flag uh, imposed on a piece. Uh, next. And this is what a, a front of any of these houses would look like in the appropriate colors for what they were in. So all these, these houses I made with different colors, uh, hopefully uh, uh, all working together with the, the roof and the, the crawl glaze, like it's falling apart. And, uh, and then I, was getting, I, I started 
as I further went on in series, as my brain was expanding and I was doing more decaling. So on this one, I learned to, uh, on, the, on the roof there is uh, birds on a wire in clouds. And I found an image and realized that if you flip the image, print it upside down or backwards and put it together, you can extend that same image and get something very long. I had not yet figured how to, how to do that uh, vertically yet, but I was doing it on this. Next. Uh, and I made these little pieces as well. So these are just like six inch little houses. And instead of the rules on the front, uh, there would be, you know, like a house on the front and a little bird hole. And on the back, I would start to put some, uh, there's like a beer company and those pictures of our, uh, we went on safari one year. And so, uh, so uh, decaling has allowed me to personalize my work. It's allowed me to put messages on, hopefully some humor. And uh, it has brought me a whole uh, another entrance to my work next. So what it also gave me was an opportunity. I've been able to do some work with the Global Health Center in, in Colorado. And uh, we saw, saw my work. And uh, so they, these became uh, awards. These little houses uh, got replaced uh, with the images that uh, the Global Health Center would, would send me pictures that the uh, awardees would send them of them doing their field work in various parts of the world. Um, and uh, so they would, I'd make a, a decal and on the roof, next one too. I would put the images that they send me. So this is a neonatology woman. And uh, it was very moving for me. I, I love doing them. And I did them for about you know, three a year for six or seven years. And uh, they were a labor of love. And uh, the love didn't end, but the labor did. Uh, but uh, they, were, they were very well received and they were very meaningful for me to do next. So at the same time, I was doing, it was uh, towards the end of the faux wood, but I was still doing, uh, I was, I'd seen long houses when we had traveled. And uh, once again, that boat shape was 40 inches. So this is a 40 inch. And this is uh, the, uh, a style that uh, has, been, has been in my, vocabulary now for six or eight years. I use this in different ways, but this was both before I got into decaling and before I got into cutouts. So I was making these, these pieces. And like I say, one thing leads to another, the next. So I started doing cutouts, that same form, um, a banner still across it, the door window, uh, but crawl glaze. And this is what I called my faux, faux metal series. It's, it's just different uh, underglazes to look like metal stains on it. Um, next. And I, I did a bunch of those. Uh, I do a bunch of every one of these, but they're all different. And so you can see how this, that other one sort of changed into this. Uh, um, the, the lines, instead of being uh, uh, geometric or right angled became Create, I don't create more movement in my work. I make difference. And, uh, and I started adding decaling. And uh, once again, you can see the image flipped here. So I was able to make a long image. And so this is sort of like uh, my thought of maybe a dream house. Uh, so sort of surreal on this side and it wraps around on the back side is a, a huge uh, lush image of terrace rice fields and then uh, birds flying overhead. Um, um, if I had a spirit animal, it would be uh, the California brown pelican. So they appear in my work a lot, uh, these birds flying around. Next. Um, and they morphed into, so this was much later, but I was getting into the idea of really putting a message on work and creating, I'd learn more about decaling, what I was doing and getting more layered and more involved. So this became an industrial scene. Oh, uh, and I had started to put uh, stencil outlines on my pieces of a climbing man on tall ones and a horizontal person. Um, I had not realized that you could still fill these images with, fill the inside with image. So the first one just had holes in them and dots and, uh, but then I figured out you could, you could do images. And uh, so once again, this is a, a same image cut in half, not half, but it get repeats and uh, a lot of industrial pollution. I also learned you can put decals over decals. 
So the little birds are just these other images I found and cut out and put them over and they're flying there. And uh, so, uh, you know, buildings like the Supreme Court building or, you know, a lot of buildings have Latin words on them on the banner. So a lot of my work is sort of like, what if? So if, it, if that's that, well, then what about why not, why not this? What that could be? So the banners started to become wavy banners and uh, the, uh, the Latin words became, became uh, uh, whatever it was I chose to put on it. Um, I, I usually don't show the all four sides of pieces because it take too long. But I'm gonna show you the other side of this in a minute uh, because this, that had morphed into this and this is a style I used for quite a while. So the opposite side of these pieces, uh, would this would be solid and where the image is would be a stencil cut out. Uh, so this one says, uh, you can't see on the X and it says, explain to future generations it was good for the, and then it wraps around size for the earth next. Uh, when they can't farm the land, breathe the air and drink the water on the backside. And that's that same form cut out. So while, while my pieces, I like them to have a form, uh, a, a form that I work off of, very iconic, very recognizable, um, and messages and images of, of things in them. Uh, to me, um, uh, they are abstract pieces as well. Um, if you disregard the words and look at all that is going on, um, um, one of my uh, uh, things that bother me about uh, make, showing th uh, three-dimensional work and even pictures is that 2D work, you uh, look around and you got the whole thing you go on the side, up and down, but you're seeing the whole image. But 3D, uh, you really have to walk around a whole piece and even see it from higher and lower to really get a feel for it. And I often envision my pieces as being unwrapped and what it would look like if you unwrap the whole thing. I really like what happens where corners come and things change. So when you unwrap it, it really, to me, looks uh, a very abstract as well as a piece which is on the surface very concrete as well. Next. So uh, while I was doing those uh, uh, horizontal forms, I was also doing vertical forms. And like that first one of the horizontal series I showed you, I was doing this uh, with drips and cutouts and doors. And like I said, I made a bunch of these and then I'd have uh, cutout panels like window, big, a whole bunch of cutouts in it. And next. And that morphed into full, fuller cutouts where a half of the half of the piece would be cut out, half would be a, um, a, a crawl glaze or some texture on the other thing, a door at the top, and and that's what those pieces became also in the three to four foot height. Next, and those morphed into uh, I figured out uh, how to make a big image, and it changed my work uh, dramatically. Um, and it was all well, not very hard. It's just just get more used to it. Uh, basically, you take the same photo, an eight by eleven photo. You take it to a, a reproduction place and have it blown up to uh, thirty six inches high. By uh, this was thirty six by twenty four. Uh, you you cut it into a little eight less than eight by eleven sheets. But uh, you cut the whole image, so you have all these sheets of it, and then you just run it through your printer. And you have these decals of these separate sheets, and then you piece them together over the course of a piece. And that way you can make an image as, as big as, as, as you want. Uh, often the lines show, which uh, for better or for worse, that's what it is. If I could have my druthers, I would prefer that you didn't see the lines altogether. Uh, but sometimes they show, sometimes I do a pretty good job of it. Uh, but what I like to do in case that they do show is to put them in a, in a geometric grid pattern so that it, they would look like uh, you know, faint lines of a grid. So you'd have a, a pattern underneath a grid. And once again, half of the piece would be, uh, the other half of this, this side is uh, just a long wavy cutout. In the middle of that cutout, I have superimposed a uh, dead tree. Um, so, and oh, and I put uh, birds once again uh, flying in there. Um, and this piece is called Heading South, like a uh, winter scene. Uh, next. And those morphed into, I did a bunch of those, and uh, I did, um, 
uh, obelisks as well, very, very similar shape, and they did a bunch of obelisks. And uh, obelisks are a symbol of power and strength. And uh, we had had the, uh, I think I said this already, that we had been to the Statue of Liberty in uh, uh, New York Harbor about 10 years ago, and it made a very powerful impression on, on, on me. And I wanted to use that image again. And obelisk and the flag was a good, a good uh, use for this piece. And so the banner became wavy, which on a lot of my pieces they are, it creates movement and why not? And uh, the statue got imposed on this. This is the second, like I said, I like to work. I had done another piece similar, but different uh, it, when I was in Colorado, where the, this, this had been imposed on the cutout part. I thought it was actually stronger this way. And this piece uh, was significant in once again, telling a story that uh, that same poem about uh, immigrants coming to America. And uh, the end of that is I lift my lamp beside the golden door and the lamp is the light of America and the golden door is uh, New York and America and all the possibilities it held. So on the first piece in, 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 uh, in, in Colorado I made, I made uh, one of the doors red, the welcoming door on the back door, I put the golden door and I put a lock on it. Um, so, um, and there is a lock down here on this piece as well. So the golden door is locked, um, the banner, the, so I'm telling you the story, but ultimately, and the stories I'm explaining about my work is that the work is meant to stand for itself. And if people pick up those aspects of it, uh, that's great. It's just supposed to be a, a, a statement, powerful, and, and once again, personalized to me. And this was significant as a second piece. You get, you know, one idea leads another, next, next. Um, on the back of this, um, the other piece I had done a cutout on the back. On the back of this one, um, I, uh, I, I've always liked uh, Maya Lin's Vietnam Wall with just a whole bunch of names. So I thought a whole bunch of names uh, like a wall, and these are just uh, immigrants, uh, prominent immigrants. You would recognize uh, virtually all of these names on the back of it. And the first four names starting up in the torch are my grandparents. So it uh, all came through Ellis Island, and so it was an opportunity to, uh, um, you know, once again, personalize it and uh, make a statement. And uh, yet at the same time, someone seeing this piece would not necessarily know any of those things, which is just fine. Uh, next. Okay, um, uh, that was, went by in a flash. So <laughs> I, am, I am going to uh, go through these next four series uh, very quickly. Uh, once again, I uh, uh, able to personalize my work by taking names of towns in Colorado. This, this turned out to be water towers. And so Pedro became me and I got to put me on in various forms of, uh, of pieces and yet still hopefully uh, look like it was meant to be on the piece. Next. And so the wooden towers became uh, metal towers and these are like four feet high, six feet high. The bases are four feet and the tops are, are two. And once again, that is me up there. Uh, Pedro's uh, uh, hippest joint in the island could be a bar and grill on the sign of a, a water tower uh, and faux metal I was trying to do. And the bases were became more and more as part of the piece. Next. And uh, a little humor, uh, take off on the uh, Chick-fil-A uh, with the cows uh, saying eat more chicken. So I found a picture of a little chicken saying eat more beef and the cows and uh, once again, looking like foam metal next. And uh, the pieces just, my decaling expanded and expanded. Those are all small parts. And as I got more into it, they covered more and more of the image. So this is still like a beer sign on the two, but uh, it became filled with imagery. Next, next. And the last one of these was, I thought, uh, water tower, pictures of water towers on water towers. Um, the New York is, Lower Manhattan is full of water towers. So that's, there are four of these around. Next. And these morphed into the bases I was talking about was becoming uh, significant to me. And so the top uh, became a cage, uh, whatever you want to call it. And they tied into the base. And in that was a, uh, a little chair I made and I put a bird on it. Next. And this morphed into a, a wonderful collaborative piece I got to make with one of my very talented studio mates, 
which has a, a, a baboon and a bird and a key and a lock and a book uh, that, that it is sitting on and it says, why am I here? And then there's a lot of evolutionary imagery in the, in the 12 uh, medallions on the base. Uh, next. And that's a close up of it. Next. So uh, next was a teapot series and you can see the cutouts and uh, this is the bamboo forest over in Maui. Um, and as the start of my teapot series and the lid kind of pick, picks up and I didn't like, I made thrown spouts because that's how I made teapots but I didn't think it worked. So next. So I uh, ended up uh, doing hand built spouts and I think they end up working in the piece much better. There's a different piece than that other one, similar but different. and I superimposed uh, uh, bamboo over the cutouts. And on the other side is that same image, next. And I did a bunch of these, next. And uh, so I did six-sided teapots and then I thought I could make some round things. And they're all on these bases once again. This was a postage stamp, US postage stamp. Uh, so, and, and the cutouts uh, ended up being a spiral around the piece, next. And uh, this is the other side of it. Um, and there's a, these are all big pieces. Everything's like 30 inches or something like that. Next. And uh, they walked, uh, morphed into oil cans. And uh, on the mainland, there are all these great decal imagery for oil cans. Uh, but over here, there's no oil. But uh, I thought I could make my own oil company. And so I, I added things. and. Uh, and uh, I liked it a lot, so uh, I made it. And, and on the other side, I was going to put another hula girl, but I thought uh, I do like a little yin yang and difference in my work. So the other side is next, different piece, but the same as the other side of this is a Duke Kahanamoku on his surfboard and uh, saying Kaikani motor oil. Um, so that was, uh, and I still, uh, every year I come here, I make uh, a teapot a year, uh, what I call a teapot. Uh, next. So uh, those morphed into these uh, big disc series. Uh, I don't like the word, but I don't really know what to call them. Basically, they're circles within circles. And I made one which was uh, more open than this, uh, three quarter open. And it suggested a series of uh, ascending uh, closures. And so I made four closing. They're not in the right order. And I did imagery uh, that on the front and back next. And that's the reverse side of this. And, and so the, the, the front and back started to change with texture and uh, next. And uh, this I made back in Hawaii after finishing all four of these. And this is a photo of lava um, on orange glaze. And so this is supposed to be like fire and, and that. And I do like the yin yang. So the reverse, the other side of this is uh, blue water, next. Um, that's not that. That's not that piece. This is another piece. But the other side of this is cracked earth, and this is that same decal I showed you as I hold it, held up before. Um, so once again, a yin yang of earth and water. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, uh, a big thank you to the Donkey Mill, uh, to the uh, uh, Mori Nui Ohana for their openness to me over all these years, and to the founders along with them of creating what a wonderful place this has been, been to the board and to the staff, which all make this place what it is. And then of course, to the students as well. So a big thank you for all, all of you. And I had one last slide I was going to show you, um, which would allow me to show a whole new series. It's in here. Uh, but for those of you sitting here, it's over there. And it's a thank you to my wife, Ellen, um, who is sitting here for being beside me for all these uh, 25 years. So thank you all very much, and I hope you have some questions. Yes, we do have questions. Um, Dorothy Case, first ask, do you have assistants? I do. Uh, the question was, do I have assistants or assistants? Uh, in Colorado, that's a wonderful question because I have the, uh, most wonderful assistant in Colorado, a woman named uh, Joan Walker, who is uh, super talented, uh, is a studio manager and uh, keeps me in line. And uh, I've learned so much from her. And 
she does uh, virtually all the glazing of the pieces that you, some of the, the ones that were in Colorado, she has done glazing for the last 10 years. And uh, I get to do the glazing over here. So it keeps my hand in as well. I must say, if you were to look closely at both sets of pieces, you would see that hers is probably better than mine. <laughs> so I am very, uh, very happy to have her as an assistant. Uh, over here, um, um, uh, Ellen serves as my assistant often. Uh, my work, my work uh, requires four hands from time to time with these big slabs. So uh, often anyone who is in my studio in Denver will, uh, uh, will call on to help assist in, in moving some of these things. Uh, so that is, that is who helps me. Okay, second question from, I believe it's from Dorothy Pace. Yes, it is. Um, she asked, how did you transition from college graduate to artist and actually be able to make it something you could make a living at? I bet your parents thought you would be a starving artist. Dorothy Pace, classmate of Peter's at Elegy. <laughs> uh, funny, funny how things uh, come around in circles. Uh, um, it's been a long time, Allegheny College. Um, um, I uh, got into clay from my girlfriend was an art major and I went up to the pot shop and uh, messed around there. Um, graduated from there and went to uh, law school um, without any intention of certainly ending up doing what I was doing, actually with the intention of being a lawyer. Uh, not surprising. Uh, things changed along the way. Time changed and I changed. And uh, uh, while in law school, I took uh, ceramics classes just because it was something I'd gotten interested in. And uh, um, by the time I got out of law school, I, I kind of knew how to throw a pot and I was still interested in it. Um, I had a, uh, a jeeping accident, which changed my life to a certain extent uh, and um, took me down a different path uh, into to, uh, ceramics more and more. And um, I just followed my lead and my nose. And that is how I ended up uh, all these years later uh, doing what I am doing. Okay, we have a few more. Are your pieces all one fired, one piece fired as a whole or piece and adhere after the fire? Um, so yeah, all the pieces uh, in this show are, uh, one piece. Uh, back in the day when I was making uh, uh, really big pieces, uh, 10 and 12, 8 and 10, 11 feet tall, um, I would make them, it was, they were great to do, I'd make them as one piece because uh, I wanted the integrity. Uh, you know, if you make section pieces, it is hard to get them to get to, to have that mono integrity of the line, continuing line. So I would cut them, but I couldn't get them to kill them way too big. So I would cut them and fire them separately. Hopefully they didn't warp if you let them cut them and let them dry out and that they will stack again into the same formation. So that is what I did. And um, I would use, uh, if they were temporary, I would use uh, silicon, uh, dabs of silicon to hold them to place. And if they were uh, sold or permanent, I would use epoxy and put them together that way. So um, I still do occasionally uh, sectioned pieces, but most of them are big and most of them fit the size of my kiln. Oh, I will say that I have done uh, what I haven't showed you. I did a whole lot of arches uh, big enough to walk through. And uh, those were made as separate sections uh, and, and fired separately and put together. I would sketch them and draw them so hopefully I had the proportions right. You wouldn't really know till the piece was done if it all worked together. Um, thank you. Question from Rebecca Horace. How durable are the decals? De decals are, are totally durable uh, because a decal firing is a third firing. You, you make a piece, you let it dry out, you bisque fire it, you put a glaze on it, fire it to, uh, I, 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 fire to middle, middle range stoneware, which is around 2,300 degrees. 
and then you you put your decal on that image and then refire it to 1800 degrees, uh, which is bisque temperature. So still hot. Your glaze remelts, and the iron in the decal fuses into the uh, into the glaze. So it is uh, it is super durable. And the clay body I've been using, I made water pieces for uh, a long time, 10 or 12 years. And uh, so this clay body uh, in and of itself is fine for outdoors, a stoneware, a nice uh, durable stoneware clay body. And so the image is, is it's, it's there for, for better or for worse. <laughs> oh, one other interesting thing, actually not there for better or for worse. You can refire, and I have done this a few times, if you don't like the way that decal comes out, you can uh, fire your kiln again, a little bit hotter than the first firing uh, with 2,300 degrees, like cone six anyhow. You fire it a little hotter and the decal will burn off and then you can uh, redo it and put, put it on a uh, different image or whatever, so. Uh, and see that Rebecca also asked, what brand, brand of decal material do you recommend? Um, I am giving, going to give you a guy's uh, uh, web page, uh, a ceramic artist named Justin Rothschank, J-U-S-T-I-N Rothschank, R-O-T-H-S-H-A-N-K. He has a uh, wonderful compendium, uh, five, four or five pages on there for everyone to see about all aspects of decaling. There are, there are several companies which I buy my paper from. I get it on Amazon now. A couple of companies had changed or gone out. I've been doing this for a while. So what I prefer, there are a couple, uh, Sunny Scopa, uh, they're both through Amazon, and Lasertran are two, two commercial names of decal paper. Uh, the question is, can you do, do color decals or they have to be sepia? Uh, you can do color decals. Uh, they are commercial. You can buy them uh, commercially made and you can go on uh, web pages to uh, uh, commercial color decals and thousands come up. And you can also have them made, uh, your own decal made by sending them an image. They are fired to a different temperature. They're fired considerably lower temperature to... Uh, uh, cone 018. So um, if you see pieces which have sepia tone decals on them and then uh, uh, colored decals, as, as you would see if you go to Justin Rothschank's uh, webpage, uh, that is how you get them. So um, they don't, they are not as, they are not as integrated at, into your piece as much as the sepia tones one. So it is a certain look of uh, add on. But you can, uh, but it's 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 a, a wonderful way to get uh, color decals as well. Um, and then because it's about the decals, Jenny asked, do you have to use an old printer or do the new printers work okay? Uh, yes, it's actually uh, uh, there's a, a technical question. There, there are only five or six uh, printers which work. It's it's sort of an anomaly. They were not made for ceramics. I don't know who figured it out. Uh, uh, Printers have had used to have uh, iron oxide as their toner, um, and I think they have found uh, far cheaper substitutes now. So they print just as black on paper, but if you were to put it onto a, a decal paper and put it on the kiln, you get nothing. It wouldn't show up because there's not iron in it. So Justin Rothschank once again lists uh, five or six uh, printers. Um, they have to be a laser printer and has to be a black and white printer. And uh, HP makes uh, several of them, which uh, I don't think you find on the HP site, but I know he has them. And uh, uh, two of the ones I use are the HP 1102W and the uh, HP 130FM. Uh, so those are two printers which I know work. They're not, uh, they're not expensive particularly because there's black, black and white laser printers. Um, and after a while, you need to replace the cartridge because the uh, ink gets worn out. We've gone through, <clears throat> we've got one of those printers through Amazon, and it was about three hundred dollars. Yes, yeah. And time uh, when I first got into it uh, ten years ago, that same printer was one hundred and fifty. 
Um, and I think now that same printer is like 400, uh, but the uh, 130 is, was uh, a little less expensive. Uh, but still, it is what it is. Uh, and one other thing, um, they do make printers which will, will print you out in 11 by 17 sheet. So if you're looking to make even bigger decal images, you could get in 11 by uh, 17 HP printer, which, which still has the iron in the uh, toner. Uh, the problem uh, for me is that uh, uh, the decals are, are somewhat uh, tricky to handle to get the air bubbles out of them. And eight by 11 is, 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 is hard enough to get it flat and even. So I, I didn't even try for the 11 by 17, even though my imp, the size of my images would, would allow for that to happen. Any other questions? I have a question. I heard that you have a great, exciting project going on. Well, thank you. I want, to, I want thank you very much uh, for, for that. Um, yeah, I, uh, here I am, uh, somewhat old, and uh, uh, a new project coming on. Uh, one of the things I like about uh, my studio, about the donkey mill, my wife uh, has had this wonderful store in uh, Denver for 40 years, um, is that uh, communities get to get built. And uh, a community is such a wonderful way to enhance uh, everything in life and the people in it. Uh, so I have had this, uh, uh, I taught at the Art Students League for 20 something years. And I have two of the uh, greatest partners uh, in Denver. And we have uh, recently uh, bought a building, a uh, fairly large, and we are making art studio spaces. Um, we are, but it's a, a sort of a hybridized uh, concept uh, there are, we're not invent, in reinventing the wheel for sure. We are maybe creating a new spin on it. There are places in many cities where artists can rent studios at uh, reasonable costs. There are places where uh, potters can work together uh, at reasonable cost, um, but there aren't many or any that do all those things. So we have a building, we're gonna have a common uh, uh, ceramics area, much like uh, the donkey mill here, <clears throat> where people will have members. There, there is a, a great need for people who are past student stage in, their, in what they do. They want to work maybe more than once a week or twice a week that they can at a studio, at, but aren't quite ready to do their own studio. So um, uh, that's what we are, a, a gap we're looking to fill. So we have a common, common ceramic studio. We're going to have a, a common jewelry area. We're uh, soundproofing a room for uh, perhaps music. And, uh, and then there are gonna be common areas and then there are also gonna be about 30 individual small studio spaces. Uh, so the idea is to uh, uh, build a art community and serve the, serve the community that uh, we're in a very industrialized area which fits our needs in some ways. It is a uh, low income area because of the industrial area. So there are uh, needs within the community for uh, all sorts of uh, community centers. So we hope to be able to provide uh, art uh, and build uh, an art community and all the good that uh, comes out of it. So we're very excited to do it. And it, it, this is really putting the heart, horse before the cart, uh, the cart before the horse, I should say, because uh, uh, we've been about a year and a half getting down this and we're not open. We're in the stage of renovating and setting up and getting the word out. And it's uh, all exciting. And we're very much looking forward to what's going to come out of it. Oh, so it is go it's going to be called Continuum uh, Art Studios. And Continuum meaning from people moving on from <clears throat> perhaps what they have been before, and also to create a center continuum. So. That's what, uh, that's what it's doing. That's what it's gonna be. So we're very excited about the possibilities. Thanks for asking. And my thanks to all of you very much for coming and for zooming in. It's totally been my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, and me, me one more uh, special thanks. I talked about everyone here, and, uh, but in particular, uh, Mina Ellison has, uh, has guided me, helped me, held my hand, and made this, this such a uh, wonderful and rewarding experience. So 
multiple mahalos to you. Okay, bye-bye. That's a wrap. <laughs> oh.